Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. I'm Don Shelley, your host. Glad you could join us today. At the time of this recording, it is early June 2019, and in the past week we have recognized an anniversary of a very important date in 20th century history, that date being June 6, 1944. Uh, the successful landing of Allied forces on the beaches in Normandy, France, and the beginning of the Allied offensive to reclaim occupied Europe. Uh, from the Germans during World War II. Today, though, we're going to look at what might have happened if the outcome on that particular day had been a little bit different. Uh, There are a lot of reasons um, to speculate as to what could have caused a different outcome and a different outcome of that landing, which was um, obviously one of the most dramatic and traumatic (laughs) days in history in the 20th century, uh, would have had repercussions not only for the short term for the remainder of World War II, but even longer-term repercussions as well. So today we'll be exploring the scenario where the June 6th Normandy landings in 1944 are not a success. The Allies do not successfully land their forces onto French soil, and as a result, uh, the counteroffensive against the Germans and the retaking of the continent does not commence. If you're looking for potential reasons why the landings might not have been successful, one of the places, the first places to look was one of the most obvious things, and that were, that would be the weather conditions. In fact, the original date for the landings was to be June 5th of 1944, and it's important to understand that the landings were coordinated with a number of factors that meant that there were windows of time when they could be successful. Uh, things like tidal conditions, uh, the conditions of the moon, Uh, Other things like that gave various windows of time. It wasn't just possible to go at any point. And obviously moving the invasion forces into action was not the type of thing that could be mobilized in a single day. And so uh, multiple days ahead of the actual landing dates, the process had to begin with the embarkation of troops to cross the channel. And then ultimately for the landings, uh, the bombardment both from sea and from the air of the beaches ahead of that, uh, the surprise element associated with those bombardments that would be followed by a landing. And so, uh, as the circumstances came to be uh, in reality in 1944, one of the most difficult decisions to be faced by uh, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower, who was the uh, Allied Commander-in-Chief, and thus had the ultimate responsibility for making a a go-no-go decision on the landings themselves, actually related to the conditions of weather and whether or not the weather would be uh, satisfactory for the landing. In fact, they pushed back one day, and made the decision to, uh, on hopes and the expectation of a, a, at least a forecast that was more favorable, to proceed with the landings on June 6th. So one of the ways that uh, history might have changed if, in fact, the weather had been more inclement that day than was actually endured, if the conditions had not been right, and as a result, uh, even more difficulty would have been had by the Allied forces and their landing craft and the other uh, Uh, personnel and material that were just trying to get ashore there on the beach in Normandy, uh, just from the perspective of fighting the weather, not fighting the deeply entrenched and well-prepared German defenses. And so one scenario that would have led to a potential D-Day failure, an easy one to look at that has nothing to do with tactical decisions or the resolve of the combined Allied forces during the landing, uh, not responsible, in other words, not the responsibility of men, uh, could simply be to look at the weather. Of course, the landing itself was was prone with difficulties. It's not hard to imagine a scenario where, uh, just because of the conditions, not weather, but just the conditions of the landing themselves, that there might have been a defeat or a loss there on the shores had it not been for the bravery that was exhibited uh, by the combined Allied forces at the landings there on the Normandy beaches. So for purposes of our counterfactual, our alternate history today, we won't necessarily go into why the landings would have failed, uh, we'll assume the weather scenario, since that removes the uh, 
questions about a number of different things that would be the possible cause. We'll use that as the scenario that we'll kick off from. But again, the alternate history that we'll be assuming is that the landings were not successful. And as a result, uh, there is not Allied forces that are ready to break out and begin the counteroffensive across the European continent uh, after June 6th of 1944. In a broad sense, beginning to look at the alternatives, it's probably best to categorize them into two broad categories. The first of those would have been the impact on the remainder of World War II as we know it. Uh, the landings happen in June of 1944, and of course by May of 1945, German forces surrender uh, to Allied forces, uh, the American, British, Canadian forces, the other allies that had landed and were moving from west to east across the continent, and of course Soviet forces who were moving from west to east, having uh, beat back the German invaders and were moving now uh, towards the heart of Germany. In fact, the period from 1944 following the landings on Normandy until the surrender in May of 1945 in many ways represents a race uh, to Berlin uh, by the two sets of forces. Certainly there were counteroffensives and setbacks along the way, uh, but at some point, certainly in early 1945, it was inevitable uh, that the Allied forces were going to be successful. They had already gained complete uh, air superiority over the airspace and in uh, with dwindling German resources and being pushed further and further back, it was only a matter of time before Germany would either surrender or be defeated. In fact, most of that period of time, particularly in early 1945, became a race between uh, primarily American forces and British forces and their Russian allies, their Soviet allies, in terms of who would be first to reach Berlin and who would uh, control m the majority of the territory in what would then become an occupied Germany following World War II. Of course, in the regular flow of history, that leads to uh, a divided Europe, um, the, the Iron Curtain, Eastern Europe versus Western Europe, a divided Germany, uh, East Germany and West Germany, a divided Berlin uh, with East Germany and West Germany. And of course, the tensions that existed around that division uh, throughout the Cold War up until the late 1980s, uh, when the Berlin Wall finally falls and ultimately there's German unification. And so much of 1944, the latter half in 1945, yes, it's the uh, defeat of Germany in World War II, but it's also the tensions that are growing between uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, and of course the Soviet Union. So under a scenario where there is not a successful D-Day landing on June 4th, the amount of time when there would not have been American and British forces on the continent would have been extended. And as a result, uh, a couple of things might have happened. First of all, uh, the Soviets were very intent upon the Americans and the, and the United Kingdom opening a second front to relieve the pressure that they were under uh, from German forces. In fact, the opening of the second front uh, in France was a, a big boost to the ability of the Soviets to begin to gain ground more substantially as they were moving from east to west, uh, moving towards the heartland of Germany. So without the landing, successful landings at Normandy, uh, one of the immediate consequences would have been the ability for the Germans to shift more forces, more likely from the western theater of operations, uh, ready to defend a pending invasion, to the eastern theater, making things much more difficult uh, and much more uh, deadly for the Soviets in the along the eastern front of the of the battle and what was going on there. Most uh, military historians would also suggest that an immediate result of a failure probably would have been the forcing of the resignation of General Dwight David Eisenhower, who was the uh, supreme commander for Allied forces in Europe. Um, in fact. Uh, Eisenhower had already written the address, had already written the speech in which he assumed responsibility uh, should there be a failure. And so if Eisenhower is removed, one of the issues that would have been immediately addressed is who would have taken over command, the supreme command of Allied forces for Europe. Um, one candidate might be uh, General Montgomery, but uh, the Americans were pretty much opposed to having Montgomery uh, in the position. Eisenhower was sort of a compromise choice in many ways, uh, because he was not the personality of a Montgomery or a Patton. Uh, General Patton, of course, had been put on the sidelines as a result of the incident that had happened in uh, 
during the Italian campaign when he had uh, slapped a soldier, and in fact was used as a decoy. The Germans assuming that he would be uh, have a vital role in the invasion, he was used as a decoy around which many of the uh, the counterintelligence activities that were used to keep the Germans guessing about where the landing would be, what the nature of the landing would be, who would be leading the landing. And so while Patton served a very valuable and vital role in, um, in the events that led up to, uh, to D-Day, uh, he was not the one that was in command. And it's difficult to know whether or not he would have been the one who would have been given command. Uh, so if there's no Eisenhower in command, Montgomery's not an acceptable choice for the Americans. George Patton, probably not an acceptable choice for the British. And so it's difficult to know exactly who would have likely led. Um, Another consideration would be that of Omar Bradley, who was the chief lieutenant and actually the one who was directly in command of the invasion. Uh, It might have been the case that even though Eisenhower had resigned, that the, the blemish of a failed landing may have also fallen on Bradley. So Bradley would not have been a choice. So historians are at a loss to know exactly who would have taken over uh, supreme command for the Allies in Europe. Uh, one possibility that's also extended is uh, George Marshall, who would have come from Washington directly over to the European theater to take command. Under any circumstance, it would not be Dwight Eisenhower. So in the short term, there would have been a pullback uh, as things were evaluated, as additional plans were made, and there would even be the question of who would be in command, and thus who would be the one that would be making the recommendations to political leaders, uh, to Churchill and to Roosevelt and I guess ultimately also to Stalin, about what would happen next. Assuming they were able to resolve the questions of who would be in command rather quickly, then the next question obviously to be resolved would be what would be the next alternative. Uh, There was an operation called Operation Dragoon, which originally had been scheduled and planned uh, to coincide with the D-Day invasion, and it was uh, to make landings in southern France. It was ultimately decided not to do that as a simultaneous operation. A lot of military historians believe if there had been a failure to land successfully in the beaches at Normandy, that the most likely plan that would have then been advanced and used would have been the plan to land Allied forces in southern France. A very different scenario in the sense that while um, Allied forces had already advanced about halfway up the boot of Italy, as a result of the landings previously in Sicily and then transferring over to the continent proper, uh, launching the offensive against Germany not from moving more directly from west to east from Normandy over into the heart of Germany through Belgium, but actually having to move up from southern France would have been a much more time-consuming and a much more difficult proposition. Uh, Of course, that would have taken, there would have been some amount of time before the operation could have been mounted, Uh, Most historians, military historians, suggest that probably would not have been until at least August, so a couple of months would have been lost almost immediately. But then the additional time of an invasion in southern France moving up through France and then making the move over into Germany uh, probably produces a timetable where the same forces uh, that originally derived from the Normandy invasion and moving from west to east are not able to reach their objectives uh, perhaps not until May of 1945, but perhaps much later, perhaps as late as July or August, even optimistically. And of course, during that period of time, uh, the Soviets would have been impeded by German forces who could have been redirected uh, from the Western Operation Theater to the Eastern Operation Theater. So the way that the actual layout of how things would have gone in the end game of the European part of World War II would have been very different uh, without the landings occurring at Normandy, being forced to land somewhere else. Let's assume that the Dragoon in southern France operation would, in fact, be the operation in play. That would have changed the timing. Um, and if the Soviets had been successful in continuing to advance, they might have been able to come all the way across Germany. So Germany ultimately may surrender to the Soviet Union instead of to um, the combined Allied forces. Uh, there are at least some scenarios where historians suggest that we may have seen the Cold War actually just be an immediate transition uh, as part of the end of World War II, where uh, as a result of the impending defeat, knowing that it's going to be to the Soviets, that the German Nazi regime may have sued for peace, may have sought to sort of restore an alliance situation, and thus it might have been the situation of uh, 
uh, American and British forces and other Commonwealth forces are now fighting a con- a v- against a combined German-Soviet force uh, that was occupying most of Europe. If the Soviets don't uh, uh, enter into a peace agreement with the Germans and they actually defeat the Germans, the possibility exists that they don't stop at the borders of Germany. And they may continue into occupied France under the justification to do so since Germany was there and uh, there's at least some military historians and political historians that suggest a situation with a delayed landing, no successive landing there at Normandy, might have resulted in a scenario where the Soviets would have had control of most of the continent. So instead of it being a fortress Europe under German control, it becomes fortress Europe under Soviet control. And again, the transition may occur where you move directly from World War II not being an end of hostilities against Germany and Japan, but directly sort of transitioning into what we think of as the Cold War. And with everyone's forces there, maybe a hot war uh, that breaks out in France or breaks out in in Belgium or wherever those two forces might have met each other under different circumstances than what actually happened in May of 1945. Another theory of a failure of a Normandy landing would have been the circumstance where because the Allies had superiority in the air and have of course been conducting bomber operations against the heart of Germany, crippling the German war machine and the, their industrial uh, and manufacturing capabilities might have been instead of pressing for a subsequent landing, for example Operation Dragoon might have been the decision to step up the bombing campaign to see if the war could be brought to an end solely by bombing. Uh, under that scenario it's very easy to imagine even more um, bombs, even more firebombing of cities, uh, trying to render even more uh, destruction against what was left of Germany in an effort to draw the war to a close. You might think of it as the opposite of the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, uh, where the Germans were trying to bring um, the island <laughs> of, uh, of England to its knees through bombing. Imagine the scenario where uh, U.S. British bombers Uh, both with night raids and day raids are actually trying to end the war as the result of being able to take advantage of air superiority and trying to use that as a means to bring the war to an end so there's not a need for a potential second landing, a potential second defeat in an effort to land ground forces, to land infantry forces on the continent of Europe itself. Under that scenario, it's also interesting to think through what might have happened with the, uh, the alliance that existed between the United States Um, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union. The Soviets had been adamant about the opening up, again, of the Western Front uh, to relieve the pressure that they were feeling as a result of uh, German forces. If the United States and the United Kingdom had decided instead not to land forces but to try to bring the war to an end as a result of uh, bombing and utilizing air power, it's possible that might have been acceptable to their Soviet allies and how that may have broken down or how that may have played out. It's possible to think of a number of different scenarios. Again, possibly a scenario where the alliance falls apart, and you may move into the situation again where the idea of the Soviets not as allies, but the Soviets as enemies comes to play much earlier. Again, the possibility the Soviets and the Germans find um, some method of bringing things to peace. The Soviets actually taking over Germany as as a protectorate against these bombing raids that are being carried out by the United States and Britain. So under that scenario, where there's no follow-up landing and the effort is made to win the war through air power, it's possible to see a number of different political and military outcomes uh, that may have come to play there. Under either scenario, the delayed landing, which may result in a different set of Soviet influence, Uh, and where the lines are drawn in terms of where forces are when Germany finally capitulates, or the scenario where um, air power is attempted to use instead of ground forces, the possibility also exists as the tension drives between the United States and the United Kingdom and the Soviets that the U.S. still had the uh, looming reality of having developed a nuclear weapon. And so while eventually the atomic bomb is dropped, Uh, to hasten the end of the war in the Pacific uh, to cause the Japanese to surrender. Uh, You can imagine a scenario where, uh, as the air campaign proceeds under the scenario where no ground forces are landed or where there's a delay and a concern about how much territory the Soviets will be able to occupy, where the nuclear bomb is actually used or threatened to be used, uh, 
to hasten the end of the war in Germany. And so instead of remembering Hiroshima as the location of the first atomic drop, uh, we might instead be substituting a German city uh, that was used as the location for the first active use during warfare of the U.S. atomic weapon for an entirely different purpose, uh, to cause the Germans to capitulate and surrender, or as a warning to the Soviets to uh, not take license with the fact that they would be able to gain more territory. And so it's not a very far stretch at all to imagine uh, a different use of nuclear weapons during World War II uh, by, um, by the Americans uh, for whatever the end might, might have been needed to end the war with Germany or and or to produce a situation where there was a different outcome or to stem the occupation by Soviet troops. So again, the possible range of outcomes there are not a divided Germany split between East and West or divided Berlin split between East and West, but a fully occupied Germany that is part of the Soviet bloc uh, that we think of being after World War II being part of the Eastern Bloc includes Germany, all of Germany. By the way, that also means including all of the resources that exist in Germany, uh, which would have made uh, the Soviets' position both economically as well as politically very different if they had occupied more of Europe and Germany had not been split, or if Germany was again sort of subsumed underneath the Soviet Bloc and in a very different position moving forward. So as you can see, a failure of the landings at Normandy can have both an implication on how the war itself would have finished out and the the implications that exist for what the world and the world political situation would have looked like post-World War II. Again, the idea of moving directly from a hot war into a cold war and having a cold war that would have a different balance of power uh, because of the lines on the map being drawn in a different way. In that post-World War II world where Cold War exists. I remember that Eisenhower has likely had to resign uh, as a result of the failures of of D-Day. And so there's no Eisenhower situation likely where he's being drafted as the Republican nominee for the 1952 election. And so instead of having an Eisenhower administration from 1952 to 1960, In fact, instead of having a Truman administration that continues at the end of the war, you may have seen a very different outcome in terms of American politics. Understanding that uh, June of 1944, another possible outcome could have been that the uh, government of the United Kingdom, the Churchill government, may have been forced to resign. And there were certainly forces inside, uh, political forces inside of the United Kingdom, who are much more willing at that point to potentially sue for peace or look for a settled outcome to the war that may have enabled Germany to remain intact, actually may have enabled Hitler to remain in the position of authority inside of Germany at the end of World War II. And so instead of having a defeated Germany, uh, there is a Germany that has survived the war as a result of a peace, the situation with France, difficult to know how that would have been resolved if there was a situation where there was a negotiated settlement, and certainly a very different world with Hitler still in power in Germany after World War II, not as a defeated leader, uh, but as a leader that has uh, taken a great deal of beatings politically, and they've taken beatings militarily, uh, but they are still survived. And so it's interesting to think about what that situation would have been if there had been a collapse of the government in the United Kingdom and a change in leadership and a change in tact and a change in strategy. Equally so, 1944 was an election year in the United States. And while Roosevelt uh, went on to win that unprecedented, uh, at that time, uh, fourth term, uh, and to be able to, uh, to not only run for that, but to win that term with his vice president as Harry Truman, it's possible to see a scenario where there may have been a different mood among the American electorate, where the result might have been uh, Roosevelt not being reelected, and uh, Thomas Dewey may have won that election, and others may have been able to impress upon him as the new president uh, a need to end the war uh, without continued military conflict, particularly if there had been a change in the government in the United Kingdom. And so while so often we think about World War II in terms of Roosevelt and Churchill and their personalities and the stamp that they placed not only during the war but on uh, the situation as the war came to an end uh, and as the war um, 
as leadership in the United States changed with Truman taking over uh, for a now deceased Roosevelt. Imagine a scenario where there is no Churchill in power. Imagine a scenario where there is no Truman to succeed Roosevelt, but a very different political set of objectives that's going on in both countries. Even if that does not happen, again, the situation exists in 1952 that there's no Eisenhower to draft for political office because Eisenhower is not the hero, uh, the commander um, that is well known from World War II. And so another personality, maybe a Patton, uh, entering into politics, uh, perhaps a MacArthur who was known to have political aspirations, uh, not to mention what might have happened in the rest of the post-World War II Cold War scenario, what might have happened with respect to Korea had the Soviets been in a different position after World War II and the balance of power between the West and the East, uh, between the communist, the communist bloc and, um, and the free world might have been different as well. Uh, but certainly there's no President Eisenhower. With no President Eisenhower, there might not be a Vice President Nixon. Uh, there might not be what led up to the election in 1960, obviously between Kennedy and Nixon. And so the American political landscape... Uh, following uh, a different end of World War II, however different that end might have been, is also likely to be very different. So as you can see, just looking through all of those ramifications, the short-term ramifications for how the war would finish out, the longer-term ramifications for how politics and geopolitics might have been different moving forward, is not hard to imagine. And so as a result... There's a lot that flows from the success of the Normandy landings there in June of 1944. And if you change that one event because of the timing and because of where the landings were placed and how the war progressed from that point, uh, the small deflection of that change can very quickly grow to be something that's larger and has much more. With both the short-term and the long-term ripples of a change to that event being very noticeable, and if you think through, particularly, for example, in the United States, the political changes that may have flowed, as we've just discussed here, from never having an Eisenhower administration or having a change in how things came to an end there, uh, it's easy to see how even politics in the United States up until today, even politics in the United Kingdom up until today, may be quite different. June 4th, 1944, was important not only for what it did in the context of World War II, about what it did in the context of the rest of the 20th century as a precursor to the 21st century. So I hope that the next time you uh, have the privilege of seeing um, the epically well done Saving Private Ryan or any of the number of other movies throughout Hollywood history that have depicted uh, the Normandy landings, uh, that you'll have an appreciation not only uh, for the, um, the actual thing that you're seeing there and the sacrifice of so many brave men and women that day, but that you'll understand the importance and the significance not only of that event for the war itself, but for what followed after that. Again, we thank you for joining us here on Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. It's our privilege to uh, visit with you and uh, hopefully provoke some thought about the possibilities of how history could have turned out differently as a result of changes of major milestone events uh, like the one that we've looked at today. If you enjoy the show, uh, we certainly invite you to uh, and would encourage you to leave reviews for us on the various places that you get the podcast, be that on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or on Stitcher or on Google Play, whatever your particular podcast aggregator of choice is. We would encourage you to leave reviews there and provide us with constructive criticism. Uh, we look forward to that feedback. It helps us to understand if we're accomplishing the goal and the mission of what we're seeking to do here at A Fork in Time. Uh, beyond that, uh, you can see in the show notes how to link to uh, other places that you can be in contact with us. You can see our email address there. That's a fork in time podcast at gmail.com. Also links to our blog where you can find us at a fork in time dot blogspot dot com. Uh, there you have the opportunity. There's a post for each of the episodes uh, to provide your comments and feedback maybe even your dissensions or agreement with some of the thoughts that are put here. We certainly don't suggest that we have all the answers when it comes to what would happen. This is a hypothetical exercise. So we would love to hear maybe your thoughts on how history might have been different or the alternatives that maybe we didn't mention or consider in the process. If you do enjoy the show, I certainly would welcome you to uh, visit our Patreon page. 
That's at www.patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. There you have an opportunity to become a supporter of the show and the various extras that we give to those supporters. Uh, don't feel obligated to do that. The purpose of this podcast is not to make money. Uh, but if you want to help defray some of the costs and provide support for the podcast, it would most certainly be welcome. Uh, we can be found on Facebook. Uh, uh, simply look for a fork in time and you'll find our page there. So lots of different ways to provide feedback to us. But more than anything else, right now we want to say thank you. We appreciate you giving us one of the most valuable gifts that you can give, which is your time, uh, your thoughts, and your attention. And we hope that you continue to listen to and find us in the future. Uh, feel free to suggest some topics to us. That's one of the things that we allow our Patreon supporters to do is have priority position uh, when it comes to suggesting topics and even participate as a co-host on those shows uh, if that's a topic of interest for them and something they have expertise to bring. We would certainly appreciate that. So signing off here now, again, this is Don Shelley with A Fork in Time. And uh, as we always suggest, if you get to a fork in the road of time, like Yogi Berra said, take it. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Join us next time.